everybody. I am Johanna Varner and I am a biology professor at Colorado Mesa University and part of the SquirrelNet team. Today I am going to walk you through how to do the population estimation module, which is one of our newer modules here at SquirrelNet. So the goal of the population estimation module is, as the name implies, for you to learn how to estimate the population sizes of different wildlife. Although this module was originally developed for SquirrelNet um, to be used with squirrels, it actually could be applied to a wide variety of other wildlife species beyond squirrels and actually even beyond mammals um, to other kinds of animals. It may seem pretty obvious in terms of how you go around counting wildlife, but actually it turns out to be a little bit of a complicated problem. And um, effective wildlife management really depends on being able to accurately estimate population sizes. So this lesson is going to introduce you to three techniques that wildlife managers use to be able to estimate population sizes. Um, and the video is going to give you a quick overview of how to do the work in the field. But you should also read the handouts very carefully for how to do the calculations because they can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Today we're going to um, practice these methods using the white-tailed antelope ground squirrel. Um, this is a small squirrel species that's native to deserts in the western United States, like these here near my home in Grand Junction. And um, these squirrels live in burrows, which they dig for themselves. They are diurnal, and so they're active during the day, which makes it easier for us to observe them, but they don't hibernate. Um, interestingly, they become less active during the winter, but they're still fairly easily seen throughout the entire year. Um, Fun fact, these squirrels are actually omnivorous, which means that they eat both plant material, but also arthropods as it is available. So I'm gonna walk you through each of these different methods. We're gonna start with the strip census survey. The strip census survey, the basic idea is to be able to walk in a straight line and be able to detect animals either by them flushing, so running away, or by hearing their calls if you're working with a more vocal species. What you're then going to do is record the perpendicular distance between the transect and where you spotted the animal. So if you have a tape measure, this can be quite easy to do with a tape measure. Otherwise, you can also make these estimates using a protractor and a little bit of trigonometry. It may also be useful to have a laser range finder, which will help you to be able to measure this distance if you have access to it. But make sure that you convert the units on your laser range finder to the same units that you're using to measure the distance for your transect, etc. To conduct population density estimations by strip census, first thing you need to do, of course, is tally up the number of animals that you've detected. In this diagram, that would be three total squirrels detected. And then you divide by the total length of the transect that you walked. In this case, that would be L times two times the average distance from the transect at which you detected the squirrels. And that, of course, is the perpendicular distance. If you want to convert the population density to total population size, you can also multiply by the survey area. So in this case, I walked a transect looking for antelope squirrels that you saw in the video. I detected one squirrel over the course of walking 30 meters, and that squirrel was about three meters away from my transect. So this calculation gives me a total population density of about one squirrel per 180 meters squared, about 0.055 squirrels per meter squared, or if you multiply by 10,000 meters squared per hectare, this gives us a population density of about 55 squirrels per hectare. All of these methods make assumptions about the animal's movement, ecology, and behavior. So the strip census method actually assumes that the animals are distributed randomly across the landscape and throughout the study area, and that all animals that are present will flush in a way that is detectable by you. Um, take a minute and think about how reasonable these assumptions are. Is it really likely that you're going to detect all of the animals in the study area, or that all of the animals are going to flush at, as you walk by? in the study area. The next method for estimating population size is the scat count method. And the basic idea here is to clear an area of scat and then return to that area sometime later and see how many scats have accumulated in your scat plot while you were gone. You can basically estimate the number of animals present if you know how frequently an individual deposits pellets and how frequently they move across the landscape. So this can be a really fun literature search for you to do where you have to look up how often does your squirrel species make 
poop pellets. Identifying the scat of your focal species is probably the most challenging aspect of this particular unit. Um, it can be really difficult sometimes to tell squirrel scat apart from other kinds of scat. We've tried to point you towards some resources in the handout to be able to do this. Um, one of the fastest and easiest ways to do this, of course, is to perform a quick Google search and see if somebody has posted some images. But make sure that you double check the validity of your sources because sometimes people who post pictures of poop on the internet, it may or may not actually be what they say that it is. Now we're going to walk through how to do the calculations for population density using scat counts. So when you do the scat counts, you're going to set up a bunch of these scat plots. You're going to return to each plot after having cleared the scat after a certain number of days and count the number of pellets that are in each plot on average. So in this case, there is a plot that has three pellets, one that has four, and one that has two. Your average pellets per plot is going to be three. So you take those average number of pellets per plot, divide by the plot size, the scat production rate, and the time that you left things out. Again, of course, you can convert this to population size if you want to multiply by your total survey area. Now, this is where things get sort of interesting, where you can go and look for this rate at which your animal produces scat. I found in the literature this delightful 1982 paper by William Karasov, in which he looked at different diets uh, for antelope ground squirrels. And what he found in reported in one of the tables there is that on average, each squirrel produced about 1.5 grams of feces per day. You then, in order to convert this to number of pellets, need to find out how much each pellet weighs. I actually did this by weighing the pellets myself, and I found that on average, each pellet that I found in my scat plots weighed about 45 milligrams. So if you multiply 1.5 grams per of scat per day divided by 45 milligrams per pellet. This gives us an estimate of about 33 pellets per day for antelope squirrels. This is well within the range of, of what we see for a lot of other species. All right, so now calculating our population density, I had three scat plots. One of them had seven pellets and the other two didn't have any pellets in them at all. So my total average of pellets per plot is seven plus zero plus zero divided by three. Each of my plots was about one foot squared, so that's about 0.09 meters squared, times 30 pellets per day, times 14 days. And this is gonna give us an estimate of about 0.06 squirrels per meter squared, or 608 squirrels per hectare. This method also makes some assumptions, and the assumptions of this method are primarily that animals move randomly across the landscape and that they poop completely randomly. So take a minute and think about how realistic these assumptions are. Um, there's some animals like rabbits that really do actually deposit scat randomly in the places that they move, but many times squirrels actually deposit scat in a midden or a nest or close to their burrows um, and in places where maybe you don't see it. So these kinds of assumptions can influence the validity of the data that you collect using this method. All right, the last method that we're going to be using in this lesson is the camera trap method. And the idea behind the camera trap method is that you're gonna set up camera traps and then count the number of hits, either images or videos, depending on your settings from that camera trap. Um, and you'll have to also calculate sort of the area that your camera trap is really surveying. This requires some technical specifications from your camera trap in terms of the distance from the sensor that will be able to trigger an image and also the angle of your lens. Uh, most of these kinds of specifications are available in the owner's manual of your camera trap. If you have a camera trap for which you don't have the owner's manual, usually you can Google that and be able to find it pretty easily on the internet. Camera traps vary widely in their quality. If you're studying quite a small species like the antelope ground squirrel, you may want to use a fancier model of camera trap, but many camera traps will work just fine for this activity that are you know, somewhere in the $30 to $40 range. Um, so you really don't need very expensive equipment. So in this case, population density by camera traps, you're gonna take your total number of images across all of your cameras, multiply by pi, and divide by the total time that your camera traps were out there, and that time is in camera trap hours. So the number of camera traps deployed times the total time deployed, times the average velocity with which the animal moves across the landscape. And keep in mind, this is total movement per day. So not just the peak running speed, but how fast on average does the animal move over the whole day? And then multiply by the trigger radius times two plus the camera angle, and that camera angle needs to be in radians. My camera trap is a Reconyx 
Ultrafire uh, that I used for this experiment um, and the manual for this actually has an image. Sometimes this information will be in a table with technical specifications. And you can see from this image that my radius is looking at a maximum of 100 feet or 30.5 meters and our scan area is uh, 40 degrees which is 0.70 radians. Um, remember Google can do very easy unit conversions for you if you need it. Again, remember that velocity here is a average across the whole day. So uh, it may be easier to look in the literature for the average distance traveled per day. Great resource for all of these facts is going to be the Mammalian Species Journal. This is put out by the American Society of Mammalogists. In most cases, you can find a freely available PDF for your species. You can see that in this species account for the white tailed antelope ground squirrel. There's a report that radio collared individuals traveled an average about one kilometer per day, which means that our velocity is 1000 meters per day. So calculating our population density by the camera traps, I got 10 total images times pi. I had only one camera trap out and it was out for five days. Again, we've got that animal is moving about a thousand meters per day. Trigger distance is a maximum of 30.5 meters and our camera angle is uh, two plus 0.7 radians. So this gives us a population density estimate of 0 0.0008 squirrels per meter squared or about eight squirrels per hectare. So again, you're gonna think about the assumptions that this model makes. Um, it basically assumes that individuals are unique and that they're using space randomly. But think about how your camera trap placement might affect the number of images that you get. Um, for example, what would happen if you put a camera trap facing a burrow that a single animal uses frequently, going in and out and in and out and in and out, but actually you're seeing the same animal. And compare that to what might happen if you place a camera trap in a space that's, for example, out in the open that is not desirable for your focal species because it's unsafe from a predation risk perspective. So in this little example today, I used all of these methods to estimate the population density of antelope squirrels near my home in Grand Junction. And we found on the strip census about 55 squirrels per hectare, on the scat counts about 608 squirrels per hectare, on the camera traps about 8 squirrels per hectare. And there's lots of different factors that could affect these estimates. This is one of the things that this module will really allow you to consider. So consider even just in my own little experiment what kinds of things were realistic, which assumptions may have been violated for each of these methods given how you saw me set these experiments up. All methods have problems, um, and the goal of this exercise is really for you to gain practice in these three particular methods and practice thinking about the strengths and limitations of each method, given your species and your habitat. This is one of the real strengths of the SquirrelNet modules is that because students from around the country are contributing data to our national data set, it gives you an opportunity to look at across a broad scale of habitats and species, do certain methods tend to overestimate or underestimate the actual number of animals in an area relative to others. Thanks so much for your attention and happy squirreling.